Uh, good morning, good morning. Can we settle down, please? So I hope everybody here has looked in your registration pack and you have found your envelope with the stamp. How cool is that, that you have a pen with the wings of peace? It's really cool, I think. So if you want to keep your envelope and your stamp as a souvenir, feel free. If you want to post it outside of Latvia, there's a post box. So you can write a letter, you can put it in, and you can post it. You can even post this letter to yourself. <laughs> but you need, a bit, you, you need a few more stamps if you're going to post it outside of Latvia. So ask any member of the Secretariat. They will help you with additional stamps. I work for UNESCO. My name is Guy Berger. I'm Director for Freedom of Expression and Media Development. And I think we are here today because I had a boss called Yanis Karklin, who is Latvian, of course, as you can tell from his name. And he's no longer my boss, I'm sad to say, but uh, I learned a lot from this man. And the one thing I learned from him was, I said, Yanis, what is distinctive about Latvia? He said, we sing. I said, what? I wasn't sure if he was saying, we sin. We are sinners. <laughs> I wasn't sure if he was saying, we sink. <laughs> he said, we sing. As you saw in the video today, Latvia has the world's biggest singing choral event in the world. So here we are. We are here to sing. We are here to sing about freedom of expression. Some people say an event like this, it's preaching to the choir. So, <laughs> However, the choir can always improve their harmony. They can always become better singers. And that's the point of coming together on a day like this, because we bring together the global press freedom community. And there's nothing more powerful than that to come together and say, we make use of this day to strengthen this. Now, as you all know, theme is let journalism thrive. Quality journalism, gender, and safety. Three simple elements. Let me just say a word or two about each of these because I think this will contextualize what we're going to be discussing. Journalism. We're in the digital age. We really need journalism. There's so much other communication that we need journalism because it's very distinctive, because it should be about quality information and about fair comment. And we know that journalism, if it's going to win public trust, it has to reach certain quality standards. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. And of course, we know that quality journalism works best where you have press freedom and where you have pluralism and where you have editorial independence. And because of the importance of journalism, we have to use today and tomorrow to try to say, how can we advance press freedom, media pluralism, and independence? Now, I want to especially underline the importance of journalism for the sustainable development goals, which were mentioned in the opening session. These are goals being developed in New York to guide policies for the next 15 years in terms of global development. These goals are being crafted not to be only for developing countries. These are for all countries, these goals. Now, the UN's top official, Ban Ki-moon, he said just on Friday, he said, Member states are deep in discussion about the post-2015 development agenda. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to steer the world in a more sustainable and equitable direction. He also said, and I quote Mr. Ban Ki-moon, free media, traditional and new, are indispensable for development, democracy, and good governance. They can promote transparency about the new goals, that the member states will adopt. They can cover progress as well as shortfalls. This is fantastic. We have this perspective coming from the top official of the UN system. Now, in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, you may know there's Draft Goal 16. It's about peaceful and uh, inclusive societies. It has a, a target, number 10, which is promote public access to information and fundamental freedoms. Of course, the people here would like, I'm sure, to say that 
This is a very welcome recognition that public access to information should be a target. But we also know, and this is really important, that access to information is not just a target, it's a means to all the other targets. This makes public access to information incredibly powerful in this uh, uh, sustainable development agenda. And for us today, I think the point is that if public access to information is vital for sustainable development, then quality journalism is vital to the public access to information. And of course, journalism is part of the related fundamental freedoms, particularly press freedom. So that's what I want to contextualize quality in. The second issue, of course, is gender equality in the media. As was mentioned this morning by our esteemed Director General, it's the 1995 Beijing Declaration anniversary, and that Beijing Declaration included two goals relevant to today. The one is increase participation and access of women to expression and decision-making in and through the media and new technologies of communication. The second goal is promote a balanced and non-stereotype portrayal of women in the media. Of course, we've seen progress, but not enough. And the issue of gender equality is not just a cause within the media, it's not just a condition for quality journalism, it's something that can have multiplier effects for the rest of society and for sustainable development. And the third topic of World Press Freedom Day is safety. Last year, the world marked for the first time on the 2nd of November the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. This year, we hope to draw even more attention to this issue. Now, think about it. If the 3rd of May gives us, around the world, a time to draw attention to press freedom, journalism, now we have a second opportunity on the calendar, on the 2nd of November. We can underline the issue particularly around safety and impunity. And these uh, issues are also very important to sustainable development because in the sustainable development goals, there's also a goal to reduce all forms of violence. And there's also a goal to promote the rule of law at the national and international levels. And what is safety of journalists and issue of impunity, if not part of combating all forms of violence and promoting the rule of law? If, with the impact of the UN Plan of Action on the safety of journalists, states begin to do better in upholding the punishment for attacks on journalists, this sends out a signal to all criminals that violent crime is not acceptable and that the state will enforce the rule of law in defense of people's rights, including the right to press freedom. So, in conclusion, before I now ask you to uh, get the wisdom of our panel, I've covered the issues of quality journalism, gender equality, and journalism safety. These are not separate issues because you will never have quality journalism without gender equality. You cannot have a thriving journalism when attacks on journalists go un unpunished. And none of these are possible if you don't have press freedom. This brings us, therefore, to the hashtags that people are using today. Now, there is the hashtag WPFD2015. There's also, I think it would be appropriate to have the hashtag hash Latvia, because this is Latvia hosting us. But we also have a hashtag which we are doing with Google called Keep Speech Free. And by insisting on the basic right to free expression for everybody, we include the right to do journalism. And we do this because we realize this right is not just uh, a fundamental freedom, it's also a central means for gender equality, for democracy, sustainable development, for the wings of peace. These are the issues that are reflected in the draft declaration of this conference. You will find, if you have not already, uh, copies of a draft declaration. We have a wonderful small team to take your feedback on, these, on this draft and to come uh, uh, back to us at the end of the event and we can sum up what did we say, what did we come to agree on. Please give your feedback on this draft declaration, which covers these three issues. Give it to my colleague Faxon Bunder. Please stand up, Faxon. <laughs> you can give it to him, you can give it to other secretariat members, or you can email him. Very easy. F for Faxon, dot, Banda, B-A-N-D-A, F dot Banda at UNESCO.org. Now, in the course of our conference, we have a lot of sessions dealing with gender equality and safety issues, so I don't want us to neglect these too much, but this session, we're going to really focus on quality issues. 
Couple of questions. How can we strengthen the independence in journalism? Not least in the media that is owned by the public through the state, where there are often political pressures. What can be done to grow professionalism in journalism, whether it's in the news media or whether it's in social media? How can we fortify especially investigative journalism, which is one of the indicators of the quality of journalism in any society? Now, I'm going to start off by asking our, our speakers to give a very short answer to the question, what is the quality of journalism? Then I'm going to ask them some more questions, and then I'm going to ask you to ask questions and make comments. If we have time, we can then come back to them. So let's try and be tight. So the first question to our panel, I'm going to ask them, is what is your view of quality journalism? How would you define quality journalism so that we know what we're talking about? And the first one I want to ask for, uh, about that is Silla Benko, who's Director General and CEO of Swedish Radio. Uh, she's been a senior executive in Swedish Radio for a long time, and she's previously head of the news department, uh, Aktuelt, in Swedish television. Silla, your view, quickly. What is quality journalism? Well, um I'm very fortunate. I come from a country that next year are celebrating 250 years of our law for freedom of expression and freedom of the press. So, of course, in Sweden we have a very, very good situation. And therefore we can also work very hardly, hard on what we think is really good quality journalism. Uh, for me it's very much about trust. Uh, it's about getting trust from the audience, because if you have trust, then it's much harder for politicians, for instance, to hurt you or to uh, really make your uh, charter smaller. Um, to get trust, you have to be truly independent. You have to report uh, on behalf of the public, which we do as a public service broadcaster. Uh, and you have to build your trust on knowledge. So uh, I, as a manager, I have to give my uh, staff enough time to actually build knowledge. Because without knowledge, you can't be trusted and you can't be truly independent. Because you can't ask the right questions. So you have to set your priorities. And uh, for us, coming from a small country, uh, we have decided that we can't do everything uh, in uh, champagne mood. Some stuff also have to be done uh, like beer, a little bit less exclusive. Uh, so we say that our uh, priorities are foreign coverage, for instance. We have the largest network of foreign correspondents of all Nordic media. We also say that we have to be truly local presence, uh, truly in the communities. So we have 25 local stations. And uh, we spend a great deal of time and money on news and investigative journalism. Even though it is extremely expensive and you have to be allowed to fail, I think it's really, really important that you as a public service company set the agenda. Okay. Uh, Silla, let me stop you there because I'm going to come back and ask you more information about the trust question. Okay. Is that okay but for that, now? But that is sort of my basic right, uh, right. branding of what is good quality journalism. Also. Thank you so much. Let me ask uh, Yuli Ismartono, who is publisher of Tempo magazine English, based in Jakarta, Indonesia. She's also the managing editor of Asia Views. Tell us, Yuli, what is quality journalism? Um, <clears throat> quality journalism, very simply, is providing the public with the correct information and news that is impartial and independent. Uh, now, that seems easy, but uh, in a country like Indonesia, where we have had our political ups and downs in the 69 years of our independence, mostly downs in terms of uh, uh, political uh, turmoil, uh, uh, a lot of uh, civil wars. This has meant a, a big challenge for our journalists. Can we be impartial? Uh, can we not take sides while providing open uh, and independent news to the people? Uh, so I agree with Sila that the trust of the people is what we have to get if we are to uh, provide um, quality journalism, whatever the risk. And that can mean imprisonment, banning, which my magazine has had experienced, or even death at the worst scene. Um, perhaps that's one definition. Thank you so much. Okay, let's ask uh, Musikilu Mujid, 
who is an award-winning investigative journalist, managing editor at Nigeria's multimedia newspaper, The Premium Times, and previously investigative editor at Nigeria's next newspaper. Uh, tell us, uh, Musikul Kilu, uh, basically, your quality you know, journalism. Yeah, I agree a lot with you, Lee, about the definition of quality journalism. It's basically about the journalism that has passed the test of good journalism, which is, uh, was it well investigated, well researched, is the story well told, does it, you know, reflect all the sides to the story, the, but basically does it help the people to take informed decision, does it advance society in a way, does it help for change, for reform, and uh, all of that. For me, I think basically that is the definition of quality journalism for me. Excellent. So we're getting a, a range of elements, and I hope people are taking note of these because we're getting a, a very rich definition here. Let me ask uh, Maria Teresa Ronderas, who's uh, director of the Program for Journalism Open Society Foundation. Uh, like many of our panelists and award-winning journalists, uh, she was also founder and editor-in-chief of VerdadAdvierte.com, a specialized site in the coverage of Colombia's armed, con armed conflict. Maria Teresa, quality journalism. Well, quality journalism for me is very far. I mean, there are two, two definitions. One, the, the usual one, the always. It's always been journalism. Quality journalism has always been verified, fair, uh, one that fights against its own prejudice all the time, that one that tells a society what's happening and why it's happening, and, and promotes the debates that a society needs to, to address. Those are the old definitions. But now there's a new, a new definition in the digital area, era, which is open journalism. I think quality journalism has to be open to its public, has to become the center of the information that the public produces. You can, you can crowdsource, you can, you can crowd edit. There are experiments now crowd editing with very, very uh, good results. You can crowd document. You can do a lot of things with your, with your audiences. And I think that's part of the ethical challenge today of any journalists, not just to produce good stories, but to engage the public with those stories. Thank you so much. Well, it makes sense for a person who works for the Open Society to call for open journalism. Uh, let's move on to our next view here. I want to ask Inga Springer, who is an investigative journalist, broadcaster, and one of the founders of ReBaltica, the Baltic Center for Investigative Journalism, which has put on the agenda of Latvian politics issues of social inequality. She's also a TV show host, and she's a winner of the Best Invest Investigative Journalism Award from Latvian Journalism. Inga, quality journalism. Thank you very much. I want to speak more about journalists in this well, definition and the role. And I would like to point out two, in my opinion, very important issues. It's courage, and it's conscious, or like your heart, voice, if I could say so, and I mean in, this, in situations when, uh, especially in this region, we're taking into account that we are living next to Russia and Ukraine and all the latest events, I mean, um, courage to say no, so to your editors or your owners, no, we are not soldiers in the war, we are just journalists, and I mean, we should say no when someone is asking us to do some stupid things or to tell the lies, and we should say no when our owner is asking, oh, just do this interview with this rich businessman because otherwise we will die. I will, don't have money to pay you. So I think nowadays in this region, the courage for journalists and your hard voice, it's very important to do quality journalism. Thank you so much. Let's ask Paul Steiger. Paul Steiger is the founding editor and chief CEO and president of ProPublica. He's now executive chair. This is a, a very famous investigative uh, journalism website. He's previously managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, uh, business editor for the Los Angeles Times, and he uh, serves on many committees of NGOs promoting press freedom. Paul, quality journalism. Well, I'm in violent, in a, violent agreement with my colleagues. Uh, uh, I think quality journalism 
has, um, whether, whether one is a large institution and an old institution or whether one is a brand new digital institution, it has certain elements that apply across um, all the borders. The first thing is accuracy. Without accuracy, you can't have trust. Um, if you make mistakes, you must fix them, um, but you must try not to make mistakes. The second is fairness, and by fairness, I don't mean balance, you know, one paragraph leaning this way, another paragraph leaning another way. It's rather, if you're going to um, expose misbehavior by a person or an institution, you give them a chance to have, um, to have some version of their say. The third is, is transparency. In um, uh, the, the modern era, we no longer have um, dominant institutions that are centrist. Um, uh, when I uh, spent my first uh, 40, 40 years in journalism, whether it was newspapers or um, uh, broadcast media, they were large, um, uh, they, they dominated the news. Now we have a vast variety of, of um, uh, institutions. The web means that there are no barriers to entry and um, people can start up a news organization o overnight. But whether you are uh, legacy media or new media, large or small, um, you must have transparency. You must, um, you, you can be partisan, that's fine, but if you are partisan, you must tell us where you're coming from and you must tell us who's paying for you. And finally is relevance. Um, uh, you must produce for uh, an audience and uh, either you must produce stuff that you know your audience cares about or if there's stuff that you think your audience needs to care about, you must fight very hard to engage them. So those are the four elements to me. Accuracy, fairness, transparency, and relevance. Okay. Uh, well, we had some really, really interesting points there. Uh, Paul summed them up in words, the ones that he mentioned. The other words that were mentioned, I think, were importance of local connections, importance of being impartiality or transparent, at least if you're not impartial, bravery and courage, uh, advancing society, public interest, uh, telling the what and the why, engaging the audience, uh, um, integrity. These are all uh, wonderful values that I think we would all uh, like to say are critical for quality journalism. How do we promote them? That is the question. <laughs> now, let's go into those in a bit more detail. Uh, and I'd like to start off by asking Scylla then about this trust question, because at the end of the day, Everybody, whether they like the media or not, they need reliable information and they need to trust what they're getting is not manufactured, it's not coming with some other agenda. So uh, tell us from your experience in Sweden, you are in the Swedish uh, public radio. Even in Sweden, perhaps you get some pressures, phone calls from government, I don't know. How do you deal, how do you build trust in, in Sweden with your, with your audience? I know you also have a video clip that you want to show us, which I hope we can show. When you deal with this? Well, um, we build trust on really playing a very vital role within the democratic society uh, of Sweden, I would say, and I never ever get a phone call from a politician, because if I would, that politician would have to resign. So that's really a good fortunate situation that we have in Sweden, and I know we are fortunate. I mean, we have a strong backing from basically all our political parties, but that also gives us uh, a great deal of um, weight on our shoulders. We have to be sort of trusted by the whole society. And in this new digital landscape with global, uh, international, big players going for our audience and going for uh, the money, actually, this is becoming much, much more difficult. We also have uh, parts of the Swedish society that is really hard to cover without getting threats. Uh, you get threats on phone calls, you get threats uh, through letters, you get people standing on your doorstep, uh, and you get threats also through social media, a lot of threats. So I think it's very vital that as a public service company like ours, we are also working on all three pillars equally much. 
which means terrestrial broadcasting, but it also means online and social media. And we have worked extensively on getting away from, would I say, a kind of snobbish attitude. Uh, I think all public service companies in, in Europe, and I'm also part of the EBU executive board, has had a snobbish attitude up till now. We have been saying, okay, we are so very good, so if you want to take part of what we do, you have to come to us. And that time is definitely over. Uh, our mission nowadays is to get our content to the audience and to interact with the audience. And it's not about handing over the microphone. It's about using the knowledge of the audience in your journalistic work already before you get started. And I don't know if we have uh, some slides here. Uh, these are the trust in Sweden. In Sweden. And as you can see, Swedish Radio are the most trusted company overall in Sweden. And if we want to keep this figure, because this is not only media outlets, this is the whole society in Sweden, we have to work to also get the trust of the young audiences. And we have had a debate in Sweden. I will give you one example on how we work with social media to really play a vital role within a democratic society. We had a debate in Sweden about what kind of words are okay to use without being called a racist. Uh, and these discussions were mainly taking place in the parliament, and in the parliament there are mainly white middle-aged people. Uh, or it took place actually on the editorial pages of the newspapers, also white middle-aged people. We have an urban radio station, and they thought, okay, well, the most important thing is maybe not what these white middle-aged people think. Let's go out and ask the audience, what do they think? What do they think, uh, and how does it actually feel to be uh, the one who gets a racist remark. And they produced this little video and they placed it on YouTube. Frustration, ilska. Man vaknar, loggar in på Twitter, på Facebook, kollar mejlet. Boom. Boom! Där är det. Det känns som att man reser tillbaka i tiden. Man måste bara vara förberedd på det liksom. Jag får blackout. Man tänker ju att en gång är ingen gång. Fast det är ju det. En gång är ju en gång. Sa de vad jag tror att de faktiskt sa. På gymmet. Fika pausen i skolan. På ett möte i krokhäm. När man promenerar på trottoaren så hör man någon. Säg, säg, säg vad du menar. Du kan få låtsas att du är svensk, men du är ju egentligen inte det. Neger. Invandrajävel. Svartskalle. Apa. Kurdjävel. Lakristroll. Negro de mierda. Och hem till ditt land. Svarting. <sighs> till slut blir man immun. Har vi inte kommit längre? Det här är på allvar. På riktigt. Enough is enough. Det räcker med. And together with this video, they also had a hashtag on Twitter. And uh, during the first two days, they got thousands and thousands of stories uh, from ordinary people, from a guy saying, well, the first time I realized I was black was when I was seven on the beach with my friends and someone called me, you know, something nasty. Uh, and uh, they produced radio out of that for an entire week. They also broadcasted live in front of an audience. Uh, they had politicians on stage. And this really changed the whole debate and the whole uh, climate in Sweden, talking about immigration, talking about people living in our country with another background, since almost 20% of the population has another background. And this, I mean, is something we have to do as traditional broadcasters if we want to stay trusted in, in the future. And if we don't get the audience that consume all their news and get all their information through social media, we're going to lose them. And then it's going to be even easier, and that's, I think, what's, what's touched on this morning, for people that really want to implement other way of thinking into young people's minds. They can do that through social media. And therefore, it's really, really important that we as traditional media outlets are out there and trying to influence the world. Mm. Well, thank you. I think you really brought home that quality is about uh, being relevant to your society, being relevant to young people, expanding the agenda, starting the debate, and uh, particularly in the issues you're raising, which are hot issues in many countries, not only in Europe. This, these are, are marks of quality media. Now, let's move on a little bit because uh, we, we defined all these uh, aspects of quality, but we know that journalists are human beings. They are not saints. <laughs> um, they do not always live up to their standards. Uh, how can we go about raising the standards of journalism in the mainstream media and in social media? Um, 
given that there is some journalism in social media. So I want to ask uh, Yuli if you have some ideas here. What do you do in your context? How do you get journalists to really stand up for the independence, the integrity, and the quality of, of their work? Thank you, uh, Guy. That, that's, uh, for us, uh, it, it's a vital question. Uh, the responsibility of freedom of speech. This is something new because we lived for 40 years under great censorship. Everything was regulated. 10 years ago, or I would say 15 years ago, we, we reforms were begun in Indonesia. And all of a sudden, everybody had the freedom to speak out. This is good and it is bad. Because if you're saying good things, informative, educational things, that's okay. But many bad people use that dice, use that forum for their own interests, whether it's for politics, for religion, whatever, hate speeches and all that. So what we are now currently learning is how to be responsible for what we say publicly. And it has had very mixed results. Now, we in the mainstream media, we have institutions, we have ethics. Uh, in my own uh, publication, we, we have what we call an auto-criticism uh, uh, regulation. We all can criticize, put it up in our board or through the email of what was wrong. We have a very strict uh, uh, regulation about fact, checking facts, uh, more than one source, at least two for accuracy and, and uh, responsibility and accountability. And most of all, in a society where corruption is rife, how do we keep the journalists from being paid to write nice things about their companies and so forth? While it's all up to the uh, individual or, uh, media organizations, but in mine, it is uh, strict, very strict. It means outright uh, dismissal if they're found. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is how we keep our standards. But having said that, let's talk about social media where everybody can speak out anonymously. Now, uh, as I said before, there's a good side and a bad side. The good side is yes, people can speak out, and it was actually through the social media that our current president was elected. Uh, he, he was uh, uh, elected because of the wave of campaign that was used in the social media, all the good support against what they considered to be the enemy or the foe of democracy. But social media has its downsides. It's also been used as a hate speech for, and which incites people into violence, into communal violence, into doing criminal stuff. So uh, how, do you, how do you regulate this without losing your freedom, without losing your censorship? This is something that we are grappling with. Now we are uh, also thinking now that it's not just the journalists who should be trained in ethics, uh, and, uh, uh, but also the public, the public who now have access to information to speak out. And so what we are looking at in Indonesia right now is the, um, a program that is called media literacy. How to, how, to, how to inform, I wouldn't say train or educate, that's imposing on them, but how to make it um, aware that with freedom there's also accountability and responsibility. So we're now, I think that universities and even uh, press institutes are are trying to, to uh, 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 apply what we call media literacy uh, in the hope that, of course, everybody can still speak, but st speak fairly and in consideration of others. Uh, perhaps I should stop there. Maybe there are questions okay. later. Well, thank you. I think that's a very interesting, different dimension to quality, which is, is quality journalism empowering uh, audiences and social media people to understand what's going on, to discriminate and to be civil and to be ethical in their own uh, communications. Uh, Musikulu, any thoughts about how one can raise standards in news media and other media, social media? Yeah, I think uh, one of the ways we can do that is what we are doing here today this conversation that we are having. And we must continue to have this kind of conversation 
all around the world for, um, but you know, the quality of journalism in places like Sweden, like the US, like Europe, of course is higher than the quality of journalism you find in my, on my continent, which is Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, or Congo, where basically, you know, people say, like countries like Congo, journalists are like public relations uh, consultants. You know, they got to be paid. The reason that is the case is that in, in countries in Africa, journalists are really poorly paid. The media businesses are very weak. And most of, even the ownership of the media, like in my country, majority of the media is are owned by politicians. So we, we must continue to discuss how to strengthen journalism in climes like that. Uh, like uh, Paul, he, he introduced Paul to say he started uh, ProPublica. Why did they do that? Because even the quality of investigative journalism, even in advanced countries, was dwindling. And now, when we attempted to define quality journalism, one key word that came out was independence. You, so he was able now, at least he's able now, to drive ProPublica to the forefront of investigative journalism because he doesn't have to pander to advertisers. He, has, he does not need to consider one owner. He doesn't need to consider any interest. So he's able to do the best independent journalism that is possible. So that's, so, and that's why I think that we must all agree on how to strengthen investigative journalism around the world. How do we help newsrooms? How do we get assist small blogs, small newspapers, to be strong enough to resist pressure, whether from advertisers, whether from governments, and all of that. i give you an example. I used to work for a newspaper known as Next, which was producing perhaps one of the best journalism on the African continent. Because of pressure from government, advertisers fled. Even shareholders of the company fled. And the paper was left without resources to continue. Of course, the paper collapsed. So if you do good journalism, quality journalism, but you don't have the kind of support you need to survive, you just disappear. So that's why we must, one of the ways I think we can do this is an example that organizations like ProPublica has offered us. We must continue to encourage people who are wealthy enough <laughs> in our society to help support media endeavors. So thank you. I, I take it then that you are saying that if you are in an impossible situation with quality, you need to find a new, a new opportunity. And we have, in fact, the founder of ProPublica, as I said, Paul Steiger here. Paul, um, tell us a bit about what were the issues, quality issues, about starting investigative journalism in a standalone outlet like yours? And how do you escape these pressures that can corrupt uh, quality? Well, I think you've raised some very, very important issues. And, and um, uh, in my um, early days in business journalism, um, in the U.S., there was still the, uh, the phenomenon of, of journalism being a low-paid and not highly respected um, occupation um, in the U.S., and you would have business reporters who would take bribes uh, to write positive stories to push up the stock um, uh, of, a, of, of a company. And, but what happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was the culture change. And um, uh, uh, journalists who would do that um, were fired. Um, in some cases, they violated uh, laws and were prosecuted and, and uh, put into jail. I had a reporter who worked for me at the Wall Street Journal who ended up in jail. Um, uh, 
so the culture changed, and culture is so important um, because now you have a, a, um, a transition that Maria Teresa uh, spelled out so, so well. We're now in a, in a different environment where the web is the driver, and um, uh, so that, that we have a multitude of voices, which I think is mostly positive. I mean, there's some, there, there are um, uh, some negatives to it, but having more, more voices instead of, of the voice of God from um, major print and ma major um, uh, broadcast media, uh, I think has many, many, many um, uh, benefits to it. So if you have the right culture, even if you're small, you can do the, um, you can do the right thing. And by the way, you can, um, if you're in a for-profit business doing journalism, um, uh, you, know, you know, when I was the editor of the Wall Street Journal, um, every once in a while we would have uh, a big company, a General Motors did it once, uh, Mobile Oil, now part of Exxon, did it once. They pulled their advertising because they don't like the story. Well, we had many advertisers. So um, our culture was no one advertiser, no matter how important, no matter how big, can cause us um, to pull our punches, to uh, print something or publish something that we, that we don't think is um, true. And, um, but that same risk exists in um, the not-for-profit world. If um, uh, when we started, we were dependent on a single um, uh, donor, um, uh, a, uh, a very wealthy couple in California who guaranteed our uh, funding for the first three years. And, and during that period of time, they accounted for 90% plus of our funding. But they were committed to our independence. They were the ones who said that, um, uh, uh, that no donor, no member of the board could influence the, the coverage. In, in fact, um, uh, they're, they, are, um, uh, they, they are allowed to suggest story ideas, um, but uh, only the editors make the decision about what stories are, are done. And the chairman has suggested 50 stories. We've done one. But we're in a much better place now because with his support, um, we have broadened our base, our base of funding so that now our largest single funder this year, our launch funders, will have only 25%. And we now have um, gifts large and small from more than 2,000 different, uh, different people. So culture is important. Diversity of support is, um, uh, 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 is important. And between those two things, I think that, that you can be um, uh, independent or at least ethical. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, let's carry on with the theme of investigative journalism. And I want to ask Inga Springer now, who has some strong thoughts on this, and I think also has a slide she wants to show. Yeah, thank you very much. So I want to talk on behalf of Eastern European countries, because this is a region I know more, and especially on EU countries, and especially about funding, because I represent non-profit organization, which is not quite common in the region, and we are a small one, just two people team, but I think we are doing a lot, if you would ask the local Latvian journalists. But the three points I wanted to raise um, regarding to the funding. The first of one, I think we are kind of trapped in the situation because we are part of Europe Union, which is very good. I think it's good that we are part of Europe Union, but it also means that we are not eligible for uh, big international foundations money, like for example, USAID or NED or other big foundations who work in the region. The only one so far we have is Open Society Institute, and thank you very much for supporting us so far. The second issue is what Paul mentioned before this culture and culture of tradition. We don't have such because we are a young country, we are independent just for 25 years and it looks like we will need another 25 years so, may, so slowly people will have this 
feelings that they have to maybe donate also something to journalism, and it's worse to do this. So again, we cannot go and ask a wealthy family maybe to give us a couple of millions so we could start our uh, investigations, like it's in the United States, or like it actually works in older European Union member countries like France, media part is doing excellent job. They revealed Marie Le Pen connection with Russian money. So it's still very tricky for us. And the third thing, could we please show the slide about European Union? We are European Union, it's excellent, but there is none funding from European Union for investigative journalism. There are funds for media, for journalism, but they are, I tried to compile some of them they have their own web TV, Europarl TV. You can see in 2013 they, they spent 8 million euros. Average viewers per month were 53,000 people. We can care, com if we can compare that there are more than 500 million people living in Europe Union. In 2014 they did reorganization. There was less money, 5 million. They reach bigger audience, but still we can ask a question if it's really so powerful. Then there is one grant which gives money also for media, and the goal for this grant is, I wrote down, com uh, to spend this money for communication actions to raise public interest in EU about EU decisions. Actually, it means to do a nice stories about European Union. From one side, of course, it's good. People should know what European Union is doing, but uh, it doesn't mean that you can spend this money for investigative journalism. In 2013, I counted the data were in PDF with no total amount at the end, so maybe we should also speak about uh, open data. And there were these 44 millions, but not all of this money went for journalism. The, only the smallest part went for journalism. The biggest chunk went for trainings, for conferences, forums, and so on. So, to sum up, there is none of grants for investigative journalism. And I think um, it's not right. It should be changed uh, somehow. And the last thing, but it doesn't mean that I'm only complaining and we are waning, oh wow, we can, don't have money. And I want to tell about experience of Hungarian journalists, because I just love what they did. They also um, are part of European Union, uh, not enough grant, and they received money from Soros Foundation, or Open Society Institute. But because of their good job, they're really working very well, they were attacked by government. You know, all these smear campaigns, like, oh, they are just sort of people, sort of spy, American spy. I know how it feels. We, time to time, hear the same about ourselves. But my Hungarian colleagues, they have a good sense of humor. So they, they came up and said, yes, we are sort of spies. And they produced T-shirts like this, saying, we are Soros army. <laughs> and they launched a, a donation campaign. They came up on YouTube and social networks and said, yes, we receive money from Soros, but we would like to continue our job. So please support also yourself what we are doing. And actually, you know what? People started to donate money. They got like a couple of months of euros every month from subscribers. It's a lot for small nonprofits. Still, of course, it's not enough to do all the job we want to do. But this is XL t-shirt because they became so popular that my colleagues ran out of t-shirts. I was only able to get this big one. And it's more, more scary. They have different types. I, at my home, I have hipster one. It's more, it's more nicer. And they started to sell, because people said, we also want to buy these t-shirts. So again, it was one way how to raise money. They sold for like 5, 10 euros. So of course, we are thinking uh, how to get money. We are not just asking money. But still, as I mentioned, we are a young country, not rich country. That's why I wanted to raise this issue about thinking that maybe there should be allocated some money from EU funds also for investigative journalism. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for that, and uh, I need to make a plug at this point because this is exactly why the Sustainable Development Goals are important, because if we say to people, in this development policy being developed, access to information is there. The, we need public access to information, and for that we need journalism. Then resources should be made available through some means or another to help support that journalism. Uh, I need to make a plug here also because can I have the green slide to the technicians? Are you, are you there, the green slide, technicians? 
Okay, I don't have that. Oh, no, perhaps it's coming. Anyway, a year ago, uh, UNESCO and the government of Indonesia had a very, very important global media forum in Bali. And we produced this book just last week of the proceedings. And in these proceedings, we really made the case that if you are interested in development, you have to support journalism. And if you have to support journalism, you should support safety of journalism as well. Many people here are actually contributors to this book. So please have a look. You'll find leaflets in your, um, on the table at the back. Look at the book online, download it, share it, use it for your mobilization of resources for journalism. Now, I want to come to a, a last comment from a speaker here, then I'm going to ask you for, for some comments. Uh, Maria Teresa, investigative journalism. Well, I, I want to say something before about the funding. Okay. Because since I represent, now I have my hat as a funder, so it's, um, it's very important that, um, that we fund uh, journalism for its own sake. It's very important that funders think about funding journalism just because it is, uh, it is important for society, not just as hired guns, as we used to say, uh, because journalism can, can, can contextualize. And you were talking about how to raise the quality. We cannot raise the quality of journalism if journalists themselves don't help people curate the sea of information that's in front of them. People, people are completely completely lost sometimes in this sea of information that comes through all these different media. I think deception in the digital era has come to perfection. There's lots of people that look truthful, but they're not. There are lots of trolls putting lots of information in the websites that look pretty, pretty truthful, and they're not. They're lies. So that's why we're trying to fund good journalism first, investigative journalism, journalism that really gets into the heart of the, of the problems. But also it's very important that we fund fact checkers. And I, it's not just a coincidence that fact checkers are actually growing in the world. We have fact checkers in Ukraine. We have fact checkers in Africa. We have fact checkers in Argentina. In places where truth has lost completely its, its way, where you have extremes on one side and the others, propagandists are going for or against something. We need somebody that brings some kind of, of truthfulness to the debate. So I think that's something that we want to do. But as many people have said here, uh, you have in the social media a lot of rage just because people are angry and they didn't have a microphone before. So that, I think, what we did, what I did as a, as a web editor was to let people talk. So when we had people really enraged, saying horrible things on the websites, we called them in and interviewed them and see why, why they were so enraged. And you know what happened? A lot of these people stopped being so enraged. And we also spot the ones that were infiltrated. It's very different kind of people. Finally, you cannot be a good journalist. You cannot improve your journalism if you're completely fearful and you're not protected and you cannot speak because you're really frightened. Frightened economically or frightened politically or frightened for your life. So the last thing we're doing, and I think that's the key, something that we really want to do, is help journalists become more resilient so that when the government comes in, like happened to in Nigeria, uh, doesn't, and if there's a government enemy of the press, doesn't stop the people from uh, the, 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 this website or this radio station or whatever it is, to keep going. And for that, you don't only need to uh, multiply your sources, like Paul said, but you also need to learn the trade or to collaborate, or to connect, or to network with those who know the trade. We have seen websites and, and media thrive because they have set up a, collabora a collaborative effort with universities, a collaborative effort with think tanks. 
with NGOs. We have all kinds of different ways of how to survive. But all of these ways, we would like people to learn how others have survived. This is a beautiful example, but there's other examples. A, a, a site in Malaysia built a new building because people gave them physically the bricks. I mean, each brick represented the money they gave. In another place, people uh, were able to get uh, sort of sporadical uh, crowdsourcing. El Español, which is a new newspaper that you haven't seen yet because it doesn't exist, did such a, such a successful uh, crowdsourcing campaign that raised 3.5 million euros before they started. And they're going to start very soon. So I think if, if you learn from the ones that are really doing the best things and are very resilient, and that's what we would like to do, try to help people to connect, to learn, and to support them in that effort. Thank you so much. So quality journalism and investigative journalism is also sustainable journalism. Silla, you wanted to make a quick comment, and then I want to ask people on the floor. Yeah, I think these figures that we saw about funding are quite interesting, but I, I also think we have to realize that there is a lot of funds uh, in the way that there are still some very big media outlets out there, and I think I want to sort of encourage people that actually can do quality journalism and can do investigative journalism to prioritize it, because this I see as a problem. Uh, we have in the Western world still money to do journalism if the owners want us to do it. But if the owners only want to make more money, then we have a problem. And to do investigative journalism costs money. It's going to fail, it's going to fail again, and it's going to fail a third time before you do a story that actually comes out and makes a difference. And if you don't have media owners that want to put their money into this, nothing is going to happen, and then we can sit and wait for these funds. Uh, I think it's quite important that the big players out there are investigating in investigative journalism because Google is not going to do it, Facebook is not going to do it, and Apple is definitely not going to do it. And if traditional media owners don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Well, we have uh, about 10 minutes to get comments and questions from people in the audience, and I see here. Uh, my Director General, the Minister of Culture, maybe they also want to raise some uh, comments, questions. Who would like to, we have some roving microphones. Who would like to, we have one, two. Director General, Minister of Culture, put you on the list. Okay, we put the public. So, okay, we have one, two comments. Let's have those first. You can ask questions, but you're also free to comment, but be short, please. Uh, very short and quick. My name is Idris de Bruyne. I'm working for journalismfund.eu and we're thinking about how to get money from organizations like Home Society Foundation, we get money from them, Addition Foundation, but also other players, NGOs and that sort of organizations to put it in the hands of journalists on a proper way. So what we, are, what we do, we are a kind of a firewall. We will announce next week in Brussels uh, 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 a, a small project, 100,000 100, euros for collaboration between African and European journalists so that they work together on investigative journalism. We get money from Open Society Foundations and we get money from Addition Foundations to collaborate European uh, cross-border investigative journalists, to stimulate cross-border investigative journalism. So there are grants in Europe too to do in-depth investigative journalism. Uh, one question to Mr. Steiger. What do you think of that concept? taking money from all sorts of organizations, even companies, um, through an organiza organization like, uh, like ours, and there, is no, there are no strings in between the, the guys who give the money and the investigative journalists. We have, for instance, a jury who is anonymous and that sort of things. Sounds like a great idea to me. I mean, I think that, that uh, cross-border collaborations are being tried in, uh, increasingly now, and, and uh, um, they've done some very good work investigating um, uh, people with uh, hidden bank accounts, for example, in, in um, uh, high secrecy places. Uh, um, uh, there, there's, uh, I think, been considerable success in 
making data taken from one place available to, uh, to other places, making techniques uh, invented in one place of, of, of available to uh, others. So I think it's a, a terrific idea for um, taking a relatively small amount of money and um, leveraging skill sets uh, across borders. So go for it, sounds great. I'd like to ask when the panelists respond at the end of the session, is there a gender dimension to investigative journalism? Let's go to the next comment from here. Okay, thank you. My name is Azar Hasrat. I'm from Azerbaijan, uh, dealing with freedom of expression uh, issues in uh, Central Asia and South Caucasus. I was surprised to hear why uh, don't uh, the European Union uh, allocate money for investigative journalism? So could anyone, anyone just explain what's the reason? Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll come back, I think, to that, unless anybody has an answer. I am quite surprised too by her revelations, but because I'm aware that I joined quite some colleagues to apply for European you know, funding for some investigation. And although we didn't get it, I'm aware that some colleagues got it. And I keep getting call for applications from the European Union to, you know, to apply for funding. So I'm, I'm quite surprised by I can answer to this. Yes, European Union is giving money for African countries. In the last 10 years, there were more than 100 million uh, euros or dollars. I'm not sure. Uh, I just don't remember. But I'm speaking about European Union countries. I'm speaking about countries here. And sure, you can say why you should give money for us, but see what's happening in Hungary. See around what's happening with all these national radical movements which are arising. We are now thinking about creating Russian-speaking media here now in the Baltic countries because of what's happening in Russia. Yes, sure, there are cooperations between Africa, but I'm sorry, we are not interested to find partners in Africa. We want to work here, and we are concerned about issues here. We are concerned about Russia here, not about Africa. Sure, there should be funds for Africa. It's very trendy now to give money for Eastern Partnership countries. There are tons of conferences, trainings, and again, I have a question. There are so many journalists working in countries, Azerbaijan, all of these. But, um, but I'm not expert on this issue, so I cannot say in general. But then I would be interested to find out how much money actually is given for this country to do content, to do journalism, not to talk about journalism, not about networking. I've been approached by, I know quite many, that are almost every month someone doing trainings for Eastern Partnership countries, because Latvia, we are located in a good place, and we know Russian language, uh, and so on. Yes, and, and how many conferences are we going to do? And when we are going to do real journalism? Okay, we have one comment here, and then uh, well, let's go first there. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Termawan from Indonesia Press Council. My question is, in defining quality journalism, it would be easier to find the lasting element, say it, accuracy, integrity, but if we want to come down into the other element, let's say language and uh, content presentations, perhaps we can still remember Marshall McLuhan saying that the medium is the message. I've been working for newspaper which uses very formal language, but now the newspaper has the online version. So, but the formal uh, version using more informal language. So how we uh, can reconcile the, the, formal, the formality and informality? Thank you. Okay, great question. Let's park that a bit and when you respond at the end, please address that. I am uh, Jamal Eddin Naji from Morocco. Uh, in, uh, in relation with the, the quality of journalism, I want to have some comments about the importance of governance inside media. Thank you. Okay, we'll ask you to respond, not immediately, but in the end. I was at a conference uh, last week, and the chair said, women can also ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say the same. Yes. More comments, questions? We have, other, we have another man over there. Very good, we won't, we're not prejudiced. <laughs> can you take it over there to that? Okay. 
Yeah, put your hand up, please, so that the, they can see. Yes, uh, uh, I'm Patrick Lorsch, head of International Affairs at Deutsche Welle Academy, which is a German media development organization. Um, thank you very much for that insight in the EU uh, funding, but uh, I, I think that is the wrong discussion. Uh, there is a, I think that there, there is an issue about investigative journalism because it is under threat worldwide, and that means also that it is under threat in the European Union, that's correct. But when it comes to Hungary or other examples where the freedom of expression and the freedom of the press is under threat, I don't think that the EU should then finance investigative journalism. I'm not sure I want to see journalism, investigative journalism financed by states, financed by bodies like the EU. That is not the issue. They do it in the framework of, free, of uh, human rights in, in, in Africa, which is not a country, by the, by the way, uh, but a continent because it was mentioned on one example among Ukraine and uh, Argentina. Uh, and they do it mainly in the neighborhood of, of the European Union, which includes Georgia, Moldova, Serbia and, and, and others. And that's fine because it is a strategy of human rights. But what we have to do, I think, in all our countries, including the European countries, to hold governments to account to apply all the treaties and all the commitments they made for freedom of expression. That applies for Latvia, that applies for Belgium where I come from, that applies much more for Hungary and for some other countries. They simply don't play the rules, they accept it and the EU politically should invest there and we should hold them to account. Thank you very much and the man over here, there he is. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Najib Sharifi, and I'm director of Afghan Journalist Safety Committee based in Afghanistan. Uh, my question is for um, Mr. Musikilo Mujit, if I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, uh, how do you assess the future of journalism in Nigeria and um, in Africa? The reason I'm asking this is because I've got a lot of journalist friends from Africa, and they've been all uh, reflecting the concerns you have um, projected. Uh, are there any attempts on parts of journalists and media community to uh, basically take journalism beyond the mess that uh, is currently, um, uh, it, that it currently grapples with? Or are there at least some debates to uh, rescue it from the uh, hostage of politicians? Thank you. Thank you. Over there. Uh, my name is uh, Rachel Nakitare. I represent um, the International Association of Women in Radio and Television. And um, I resonate very, very well with what uh, Musikilu talked about. But I'm also a practicing journalist uh, working for the National Broadcaster in Kenya. And I was just keen, I was very impressed by what Celia talked about, um, uh, the trust that the Swedish people have in Swedish radio. And um, I was just looking at the challenges that we have in Africa, especially the public broadcasters. In fact, uh, like Musikilu said, um, media is a business in Africa now. And that's why politicians are running to own media in Kenya, even our own president uh, decided to own one of the media outlets because he realized it was a tool for him to fight the opponents. But I would be keen to hear from you how the public radio has kept afloat with the challenges because um, if I look at the Kenyan scenario, there's even, um, the, the, the Kenyans themselves would prefer to watch and listen to the private media because of um, the, 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 the kind of, not, not just independence, but the freedom they have in terms of uh, editorial independence, as opposed to, uh, to, the pro broadcaster, to, the to the national broadcaster. And this has then been a challenge even in terms of the public broadcaster defining um, their objectives and defining themselves because of the competition that comes in from the, the private media. Super. I think we have to begin to wrap up now, so let's ask the panelists for their final statements, and I hope they can respond to some of the points raised. 
Uh, why don't we start in that order from the left Inga and come all the way through. Okay. Maria Teresa? I just wanted to, to, to refer to two of the questions that, uh, that uh, what, how do you deal with the formality and the informality, the formality of the traditional media and now in the web, the informality. And I think uh, the best thing you could do is uh, let the younger people run the show <laughs> and then the old can follow and teach their wisdom and, and teach their know-how in investigative journalism. But I think the younger people are the ones who are actually pushing, pushing the way that journalism should be done. I think a lot of media in the world are having a lot of trouble in that change. This is not a, a minor thing. There are many, many uh, journal, um, newspapers in the world and magazines that are failing and even television stations because they don't know how to do this transition unless you call in, in a very nice way formality to informality, but I think if you leave the younger people that are native to digital era lead the way, you can follow with the wisdom, with the depth, with the good journalism you know how to do, and I think that's, that's something. And another thing that, that I had a question, there was another question was about governance inside the media. Uh, I don't know exactly what you meant, but, uh, but we do I think it is very important to have good editors. I think editors are a, 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 a dinosaur a little bit. They're being considered as dinosaurs today by a lot of new media. They're being seen like the, like the, 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 the species in extinction because they're nobody, nobody thinks they're, they're necessary. I mean, if you write, you go to the web, you upload this, and it's already on the web, who needs an editor? Editors are just something that delays the news. Well, actually, I think today, if I run a media, the most important thing you have to have is editors, good editors, that can actually curate, verify, make sure that what you're publishing is good stuff. Because if you don't, you can get into legal trouble, you can get into physical danger, you can get into all kinds of trouble, but also you're deceiving the public because you're telling them you're running a news web and you're not. You're running an opinion web or whatever it's called. But if you are calling yourself a media, you need to have editors. You need to have some kind of filter that actually values the work of the reporter and works with them to produce good stuff. It doesn't matter if it's in graphics, in videos, uh, data, visualization, in whatever shape and form, in Facebook, in Twitter. There are media that exist only in Twitter. There's media that has been created only for Facebook. But they do need editors. I think that's the key piece of the newsroom that cannot be done with if you are if you want to call yourself a journalist. Thank you. I would uh, speak to the question of government support, and I, I very much understand uh, the concern that um, uh, since government is one of the, if not the largest, uh, it, it's certainly one of the largest uh, targets for investigative reporting, and um, how can you freely investigate um, the organization that's paying you. And I, I think one uh, can get government support if it's channeled in a way that um, uh, politicians don't get to decide who specifically um, uh, gets the money. Or if you have a situation as in uh, Britain with the BBC, you have an institution that is um, uh, has such a strong culture that it's going to be um, uh, independent almost no matter what the, go the government decides. So, um, uh, look, I think it's, it's um, the world is changing so rapidly, we need to find a wider and wider variety of sources of, of uh, funding because the um, traditional businesses are, are no longer capable of, of uh, 
uh, funding the amount of investigative reporting we need, but we need to be very careful about the way in which big players like governments uh, get into the game. Well, I'm going to try to answer the question, I think. Um, once again, we are very privileged in Sweden, I know that. Uh, we have a very stable public service system. We are public service broadcasters. It's not the equivalent as being a state broadcaster. Being a state broadcaster is something completely different. Uh, being a public service broadcaster means three things. First of all, you are run by not the government and not by commercial interest. In our case, we are owned by a foundation. Second, you have your funding, not through the state budget. We have our funding through a license fee system coming directly from the, from the people. And third, you get a charter that is taken by parliament, and once you get this broad remit without detailed regulation, you're left alone from political influence for, in our case, a period of six years. This is what makes it public service. This is what is a public service broadcaster. And I agree with our fr friend from Deutsche Welle, where the European Union can do more is to put pressure on other governments to actually implement true public service broadcasters in countries where you want to have a well-functioning democracy. Because then you need it. You need a player on the media market that is not run by the state or by commercial interest. And that takes political support, once again. This is sort of how I see the future. If we want to have a well-functioning media market with this huge commercial influence that we have today, we need public service broadcasters. We need political support for public service broadcasters. And here, the European politicians can do more. Put pressure on countries implement public service broadcasting and make sure that there are fundings for it. Thank you. Yeah, first, I like to talk about the issue of governance inside the media. Then I, I, I talk about the issue of journalism in Nigeria and Africa. Now, I'm aware that if a lot of media organizations are beginning to take governance seriously. Uh, in our case, in premium times, you know, we have a board, we have a board of advisors, we have a board of editors, and we expect that all those levels of checks will always put us on our toes. I'm aware that even ProPublica has a board of advisors and all level of boards, and then the New York Times having even a public editor and all of that. All those kind of appointments and structures, uh, you know, based on the need for accountability. And so I, I think it's something that uh, other media houses will need to look at, uh, the issue of governance within the media. Because when we, were, we try to talk about quality journalism, we talk about transparency. So how do you have structures in place that enhances transparency within the media itself? So I agree entirely with you that there is need for deep governance within the, the media. Uh, you, you, a colleague, asked about uh, the future of journalism in Nigeria and Africa. Uh, you know, Africa is qu quite a large continent. I don't have, uh, I'm not an expert on Africa, but at least I can talk about Nigeria, where I'm based and where I work. I'm really, really optimistic about the future of journalism in Nigeria. And uh, this is because Given our own history, my own example, four years ago, about four years ago, we started a newspaper, which today is one of the most reliable sources of information about Nigeria. In those days, we would need billions of Naira, Nigerian Naira, to start a newspaper. And that meant the Nigerian people needed to depend on billionaires who own newspapers to give them information about their own country. And a lot of them politicians who have interest to pursue. That is no longer the case. Now, whole manner of websites are starting up with low budget. Of course, there is a problem of quality. We have to deal with that. But the, the media landscape is widening. And so it's better for people now 
In those days, Nigeria used to have a public broadcaster, not public service broadcaster. We still have that, known as the NTA. We have the Radio Nigeria, and that whole 100% by government. And you are told only what the government wants you to know. Today, we have several private radio, private TV stations. The media landscape is expanding. Nigeria now has a freedom of information laws. Things are getting better. And so I'm really optimistic that journalism will continue to grow and expand. Of course, I like to talk about the issue of quality. It's a big issue that we are grappling with. But I'm sure that it will only get better. If anybody wants to talk about Africa, I think Eric is in the hall. Uh, he works for the uh, African Media Initiative. He is an expert. On, <laughs> okay, on but could we yeah. need to pass on the mic to Thank you. Um, in time. <clears throat> I come from Indonesia, a country in Southeast Asia, of the ASEAN countries, the mem 10 member countries. Perhaps only two can claim to have press freedom or the freedom to speak out freely. And that's my country, Indonesia and the Philippines. But we have to deal with uh, the lack of knowledge on how to deal and handle. Do we want to give this away? Do we want to go back to the days of censorship? No, but we have to be responsible for it. So uh, what we have to deal here, I think, is uh, something like media literacy, media responsibility. This is what we're grappling with. We, we, we don't want to, to lose that freedom of being able to speak out, but there are, after all, uh, uh, many, uh, still 15 years, no, is it 15? Yeah, 15 years after we changed government from a, from a dictatorship or, or really a very tight uh, government to a more free system, that we are learning how to deal with freedom, freedom of the media, and how to use it. So media literacy in our continent, I think, is a new thing that we are pushing for so that we can enjoy and make use of that uh, freedom to really express ourselves freely. And I think that uh, we have a lot of work to do right now. Thank you. Well, so I, I think this was really a good session and I hope you agree with me. And I think it's quite clear that if we want journalism to thrive, we have to do, we have to do a lot of work to convince governments owners, advertisers, donors, audiences, social media users, and journalists about how important the quality journalism is and how important investigative journalism is. And that we have to do because we have to convince that press freedom is precious. So thank you very much, and thank you to our panel. <laughs>